to a very special episode of Kludge Cast. I'm Matt Schroyer, and I'm in my project car, the BMW Z3 Roadster. On today's episode, I address a critical shortcoming on the BMW Z3 Roadster. Now, the Z3 Roadster has many fine qualities, from the tight steering rack to the inline sixes available for it. However, it does suffer from one big engineering flaw. And on today's episode, I'm going to attempt to address that. To tell you about the flaw, I need to tell you a little bit about the Roadster and where it came from. The first BMW Roadster was available as a 1996 model with an inline four-cylinder motor featuring 1.9 liters of displacement. That left people wanting just a little bit more. And that's what BMW gave people. They gave people more, more options and more cylinders. From that point on, you could buy a BMW Z3 somewhere in the world with a two liter inline six motor, a 2.5 liter motor, a 2.8 liter motor, a 3.0 liter motor, and even in the M models, either an S52 or S54 3.2 liter motor. Now that sounds great except for one big issue. As the engines got bigger, BMW did not reinforce key parts of the body. The problems first started cropping up in M Roadsters that were uh, driven pretty heavily on track or in autocross. And what those owners were finding was that the trunk floor was tearing away from the vehicle. And what was really happening was all that torque coming through the engine, transmission, and into the differential was actually twisting the rear subframe and pulling the trunk floor to the ground. What these owners were finding was that their trunk floors were tearing at these spot welds and also the ear for the differential mount was tearing some as well. Now what did BMW do about this? Well, first they fought it a lot. Eventually BMW offered a fix for this. What did they do, you might ask? Well, if your vehicle was under warranty and was starting to tear at the subframe and the trunk floor substantially, you could take it into BMW and they would put in another floor in your car, the exact same floor, which probably would just tear again anyway. So that's pretty bad and BMW never really offered a substantial fix for this issue. To this day, BMW Z3 owners really have to do their due diligence before owning the car and really have to know how to address this issue. One popular remedy to reduce this issue is to remove the factory rubber subframe bushings and replace those with more firm polyurethane units. And this does help considerably because the firmer that those subframe bushings are, the less that the subframe will twist against the trunk floor. I did actually install those polyurethane subframe bushings a while back and I do think that it's improved the car dramatically. Oftentimes people complain that on the stock rubber subframe bushings the rear end tends to wander. It's like you turn the car and then a moment later the rear end of the car joins along. When you pop those polyurethane bushings in there it really tightens things up a lot. The car handles much more competently. So besides it being a precautionary measure against trunk floor failure, I recommend the polyurethane subframe bushing uh, regardless. It's just a great enhancement. It's not that difficult to install. It can be done in your garage. Every Z3 owner should be looking to do that, even if they don't track their car. However, it is not a cure-all, and I think in this vehicle, while I don't see any substantial rips uh, of the trunk floor, or of the uh, differential ear or mount, I am noticing that the spot welds are starting to look a little bit iffy and it looks like it indeed is tearing away. Fortunately, there is another option. And for that, I need to tell you about a gentleman named Randy Forbes. Now, Mr. Forbes purchased both S52 and S54 versions of his M Roadsters and promptly began autocrossing them. He was one of the first people to probably tear his trunk floor. Now, Mr. Forbes was displeased with the way BMW had handled this situation and how they were only going to replace the defective unit with another defective unit. So he decided to engineer his own solution. 
his solution was to cut open the trunk floor and reinforce important sections with steel panels. Something else that Mr. Forbes did that was very important was that he welded in additional ears for the differential. On the E36 M3, the differential cover actually has two ears, and neither the M Roadster or M Coupe ever came with dual ear differential covers. Not only does Mr. Forbes' kit address a structural engineering issue on the Z3, it also enhances it with an option that didn't exist. Mr. Forbes has installed his trunk floor reinforcement kit on dozens and dozens of roadsters over the years, and only recently decided to step away from that and let others do that work. You can still buy the Randy Forbes trunk floor reinforcement kit, and you can do that yourself if you have a fair bit of welding skill, which I certainly don't, and uh, it seems like a big enough issue that uh, I would prefer to have a professional handle that instead. So in this episode, I'm taking the Z3 Roadster down to Clown Shoe Motorsports in Dallas, Texas, and having those experts install the subframe kit with the dual ear differential cover upgrade. Clown Shoe Motorsports came highly recommended by Randy Forbes himself. They have a very interesting history in their own right with racing the BMW Z3 Coupes, also known as Clown Shoes. Hence the name, Clown Shoe Motorsports. So yeah, let's get this done. Andy, pleased to meet you. Good to meet you, Matt. Yeah, so um, first, thank you for the uh, reinforcement. I, I appreciate help, preserving the, uh, the Z3. I want to keep it a long time. Uh, your shop has a pretty cool story. Clown Shoe Motorsports, it's really the only shop like it in Texas, and I think probably only the only shop like it in the country, right? Yeah, I, I'd say that's not unreasonable. I mean, not, not a whole lot of folks are specializing in a obscure 20-year-old plus chassis. <laughs> You were telling me that it's just kind of an age issue and an under-engineering issue with the trunk floor. So what kind of goes on with these Z3s as they age? So, I mean, there's a lot of things, but most of it has to do with those rubber bushings just wearing out. And then you get excessive flex on everything. And then as that subframe unit is able to twist and flex, it ends up stressing that metal a lot more. Over time, you get a bunch of metal fatigue and it just starts breaking stuff. It, it's definitely not as prevalent as like the E46 chassis failure. Um, so the E46s, the chassis fail also where the subframe mounts on. But on those, if I see 50 of those cars a year, yeah. 48 of them are gonna have some signs of failure already forming. On Z3s, you know, if I see 50 Z3s a year, 10 might have really minor damage that is starting but this isn't a like snap bang done kind of failure it's something that happens gradually over time it's rare that i get one in that's really really bad uh well it's not that rare because a lot of people will let it go to that point um, and that does unfortunately increase the cost some when we're having to do a lot of like actual repair and remediation of the chassis to get it back to kind of normal and then we can do the reinforcement. I, I wouldn't say it's something all Z3 owners would, would have to do. It's a net loser when it comes to like resale value, but as far as modifying your car goes, it's probably one of the biggest bangs for your buck that you'll ever get back. I mean, a reinforcement might cost anywhere between, you know, 3,500 and 5,000, depending on how deep you're going and if you're doing other upgrades. And chances are you'd be able to recover at least 2,500 of that on resale. Whereas, I mean, a lot of stuff, you know, I spend $5,000 on a set of MCS on my car and I go to sell the car, I only add $1,000 to the value. So bang for the buck, it, it's pretty good as far as resale goes. I haven't seen an increase in frequency of failure on S54 cars. So I, it, if it's a power thing, I'm not seeing it. You specialize in clown shoe, the, the, the M coupes, Z3 coupes. Um, why, why clown shoes? What, what brought you to that, that kind of BMW? It's a lot more functional than a Roadster. I, I daily drove a Roadster for 11 years. And aside from the bonus that, you know, you can put 15 foot strips of lumber in it if you put the top down, um, there's not a whole lot of utility in the Roadster. 
the coop, like you can put a bunch of stuff in the hatch. I mean, it, it's it's a, a great little grocery getter, and my dog likes to ride in the back, so I open up the hatch and he just hops right in. It's a very capable track car once you spend a bunch of money on it. Truth be told, it's not as good of a track car as an E36 or an E46. Um, you've got to spend a lot of money on it just to get it to the point where it's comparable. And even then, the E36 and E46 are gonna be a lot easier to drive at the limit, um, but they're not as much fun. The, the Z3 just constantly wants to kill you. It's got a really short wheelbase, you're sitting right on top of the rear axle, you really feel it when it starts to step out, and it, it's just, it, it's a handful, but it's a lot of fun. You're involved in, in NASA here in Texas. Tell me about your motorsports background. Did one DE and then immediately started racing wheel to wheel, rented a seat from a Lemons team that I knew, uh, started racing with them, and then that morphed into we have our own WRL team. Uh, we raced in WRL for a couple years. We were on the podium for the national championship in 2018. A lot of our customers spent a lot of time on the top of the podium, too, so it, it's I'm kind of relieved that it's not just us. I don't have enough time to be able to compete on the NASA weekends. It's tough to be able to actually go and compete as well. So, I mean, I'll, I'll take it out in the TT groups and it's class for TT. And I've been just waffling back and forth on whether or not I want to go just full race car on it or re-street car it some or what, because I've got three other race cars. <laughs> um, but yeah, this is this is my only clown shoe. And then we have, uh, there's a yellow E30 race car over there. Uh, we have our E36 M3, that was our endurance race car that we raced in WRL. This S52 has been completely gone through. So it's got, I don't know, 3,500 miles on it. Uh, bottom end was all refreshed, new rings all new race bearings, oil pump, baffle pan, whole nine there. The head is actually where most of the work was. It's a full Supertech valve train, so all Supertech intake and exhaust valves that are lighter and stronger. They're also single groove keeper instead of triple, which holds a little bit better. Supertech dual valve spring kit, all new valve guides, uh, some head porting. Uh, it's got an Epic Sport cam in it and then the M50 manifold and everything else. Uh, on the stock DME, it made 263 wheel horsepower, which for an S52 is not bad. It gets a lot of love on track. It gets a lot of abuse. <laughs> <laughs> it's neglected a lot because people won't stop paying me to work on their damn cars, so I have very little time to work on this. I'm not complaining, by the way. I like money. <laughs> Had a lot of time and a lot of money put into it, but it, it is, definitely neglected quite frequently. But it, it takes a beating and it, it keeps on going. Come out and go for a run. Oh. And then, so, there's also these wings that yeah. come up. And really what we're doing here is this whole structure inside is basically an I-beam. So we have a very bottom piece that gets welded on into that channel. And then you have a vertical piece that's here where this is tied in that comes up. And then your two ears for the diff mount, if you do the dual ear, are tied into that piece. And then these two top plates here get welded to that. And it ties that whole I-beam structure together. But we've only moved a little bit of the load from where it can pull down because in the, the factory setup, that whole channel is, you know, just pushed and welded up. So if it comes down, it wants to separate. So now with just the I-beam, we've at least moved that load from underneath to where now it's sitting on top of the trunk floor. But that's not quite enough because it can still pull down some. So that's what these wing pieces do. This whole I-beam structure here gets welded to this piece. And then this piece takes all that load and carries it onto the tops of the frame rails. And because those frame rails are, you can see it's like a hexagon here, but it's not a solid member. It's two halves of a hexagon. So in the stock configuration, you can actually have here in the middle, 
it'll start to pull down and separate and open it up. And that's when it starts getting really bad and a lot more expensive to repair and all of that. So the, the Randy Forbes kit is it, it's pretty ingenious in how he built it. And he hasn't really had to revise it much over the years. And I, I mean, there are improvements that could be made to it, but they're so marginal and the increased cost is high enough that why do it? Yeah, 99% yeah, of the time, I'm just putting a Randy Forbes kit in. Um, it, it has to be really bad to where I've got to cut everything out anyways until we start talking about like, okay, we're gonna do a, a custom cross member and then we'll do the entire cross member out of like two pieces of, it'll be like three by two channel and then we weld those together and they'll come up and actually like, tie into the top and bottom and kind of mouth into the frame rails and then that whole thing gets welded in but then all your trunk pieces don't fit right and everything else so you know th this kit for what it is it it's pretty fantastic um as far as diy stuff goes it if you're if you're a welder that is comfortable welding very thick metal to very thin metal it's not the worst thing in the world um the problem is most people don't have much experience with that. Even people that have welded a lot of stuff, it's generally like, yeah, you're welding two pieces of eighth inch or three sixteenth inch steel together. You're not trying to weld 18 gauge to three sixteenths. So that's only part of the challenge. The other part of the challenge is that you're really only able to prep one side of the metal. So you already have this massive burn through issue where you're worried about just blowing through that thinner metal. So you technique wise have to have just the right combination of settings on the welder, skill on where you're walking the puddle down and then wire thickness and everything else. But once you have all that, then you have the problem of you're not able to have fresh, clean, bare metal. So you have a lot of contamination issues. Oh, and then I had a little bit of stain remover, so I was able to clean oh, up your trunk you. mat a little bit too. <laughs> I appreciate that. No, that 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 is a a, uh, a good customer service right there. Yeah, we try. I I enjoy these and that I enjoy saving these cars, but man, it is a lot of work. And sometimes I just wish I could do brake jobs and oil changes all day, but you know, you, you make your niche and you're good at something, and that's, and that's people start asking for you then, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And Randy sends me a, a bunch of guys, and now that he's really pushing harder into retiring he keeps sending me even more so I, I keep hoping that i'll have a break and be able to work on my own cars and then and then randy calls <laughs> <laughs> yeah cool all right okay so it's been some months now since i've had the car back i wanted to give plenty of time to sort of formulate my opinion on it uh, give you some feedback about what I noticed from uh, the handling of the car. But before I do that, you're probably really wanting to know what actually went into the process of installing uh, this reinforcement kit. I don't have any footage of that because I wasn't able to stick around, but uh, Andy was kind enough to provide a flash drive with a lot of photos documenting the process. And if you do decide to go forward and have this reinforcement done on your car, this kind of documentation is worth its weight in gold to uh, future prospective buyers if you're really worried about uh, retaining the value of the vehicle or getting some of that investment uh, back from the car. So I'm just going to go ahead and play you a slideshow of some of the things that went on uh, during that whole process. Basically what this process involves is cutting open the existing channel that exists in the trunk floor welding a bunch of uh, reinforcement panels uh, into that channel but also going below the car and doing away with the factory ears to mount the differential and going with a much stronger a much more stronger solution and you'll notice on this example at least that uh, we're going with the dual ear uh, conversion, so going from a one ear to uh, two ears. After all that's done, an additional panel is welded on the top of the entire channel and it's all prepped with uh, paint to look good as factory. So as you can see, it's a pretty involving process 
and uh, you want to have this done by someone who's done a couple kits before. The instructions do come with the kit, so if you're adventurous, you can try this on your own Z3. Uh, but for peace of mind and for something this important, um, really do consider a professional to go ahead and handle this installation for you instead. So after all that was done on the car, what did I notice? Did I notice any difference in handling? Well, that's actually difficult to give an answer to since a number of things were done on the car during this conversion. It wasn't just a matter of welding in reinforcements. While the rear subframe was out, I went ahead and had Andy install some new fresh AKG polyurethane uh, bushings on the control arms. And we also went with uh, AKG polyurethane bushings for the uh, differential ears. And driving around the car, you do notice things are just a little bit heavier in the rear. It's maybe a 10 pound difference, but uh, the car is, is very nimble to handle. So you do actually notice this, but the biggest thing I noticed from driving the car around was that uh, the rear end wandered a lot less over bumps, even just going straight down the road. Talking with Andy, that's probably due to the trailing arm bushings and not really due to the reinforcement. Really, the reinforcement is just there to make sure the trunk floor doesn't fall apart. The other change that I noticed was that I heard uh, quite a bit more whining from the diff. Not any kind of like angry whine or anything that would lead me to believe that the differential is going bad, uh, but it's simply just a matter of the polyurethane bushings on the differential cover just transferring a little bit more of that uh, vibration and noise into the subframe, into the car, and, well, into your body. So yes, in total, the car is a little bit more rigid. Uh, that also means it's a little bit more harsh on the roads, but again, this probably goes down to the polyurethane bushings. I should also note, if I hadn't mentioned before, that I already did the polyurethane subframe bushing. So the entire rear end is polyurethane now, and it, I'll have to be honest, with the lowering springs, and even on the lowest setting or the softest setting on uh, the Kony adjustable shocks, it is, <laughs> it is harsh on these roads, but we don't have the best roads in Oklahoma City, so, you know, go figure. But uh, I am pleased with the handling overall. It is a much more competent vehicle after all this has been done to it. The big question now, should you do this to your car? It's complicated. It's, it's a complicated answer. And the reason for that is it's it's a quite expensive thing to do to your car. I believe Andy said they can range any anywhere between two thousand five hundred dollars and up to five thousand dollars, and and even more than that, depending on uh, the current condition of the car. So what I would say this is this is kind of my rough guideline on whether to do the Randy Forbes subframe and trunk floor uh, reinforcement. If you have a lower spec model like a one point nine or maybe even a 2.5, you may not want to go ahead and do this unless it's a really important vehicle to you. Like, if you're doing this not for real sale value, um, but to preserve something that's been in the family, or maybe it's your first car, if it's a very special car, then and only then would I suggest that you go through with this, even if the car is about to be totaled from damage in the trunk floor. And that's simply because it's so expensive compared to the value of the car and since it's already a low spec and a common spec you probably are not going to get a great return on investment your best hope is to go ahead and uh, sell that vehicle for whatever you can and put money into a, a better z3 or maybe better is the wrong word a higher spec z3 better is <laughs> better depends on a whole lot of things now if you're talking about a 2.8 liter or a 3 liter the value proposition changes a bit. There's still a lot of factors to consider, but uh, you might find that it's it's worth it, especially if you're already starting to see damage on the car. For M Roadsters and uh, M Coupes, you know, the 3.2 liter, either the S52 or S54, it leans more towards, yes, you know, have it done and maybe even have it done as a precautionary thing. I predict over the years these cars are going to in increase in value. Um, so if you're looking at it uh, from an investment perspective, which I really don't recommend you do, but if you are, um, it's definitely something to look into, probably even to have done uh, as preventative, even if you don't notice any harm on the car. 
this could probably preserve the value uh, for many years down the road. As for the right time to do it on a lower spec vehicle, you probably want to wait until you start seeing some weird things happening. You don't want to wait until your ear is starting to tear. But if you have a few popped welds in the trunk floor, um, I don't think now is the time to panic. Definitely put the polyurethane units in and see how that goes. But uh, if you have a you know three uh, popped welds, maybe that's the time <laughs> to to get the kit and start looking for an installer. Again, these are just rough guidelines. It's it's a it's a big purchase. It's a big decision, and there's a lot of things to weigh. So there's not one answer for everybody. But anyway, that's that's all I've got to say about it. Uh, if you have any questions about this procedure, go ahead and, and leave it in the comments. Otherwise, I want to thank you for joining me on this uh, journey, and we'll see you down the road.